And now from our studios in downtown Winnipeg, it's time for 107 Live. This Saturday at the University of Winnipeg's Eckhart Gramate Hall, the Virtuosi Concert Series will welcome the marvelous Trio Saint Laurent to the stage in a concert that is called Homage à Schumann. It features works by Robert Schumann, as well as music of Niels Gada, Mozart, and others. The Trio Saint Laurent consists of three of Canada's foremost chamber musicians, pianist Philip Chu, violist Marina Thibault, and clarinetist Jean- Jean-Francois Norman. Joining me here in the Classic 107 studios is Trio St. Laurent. Welcome to our Classic 107 studios and a rather snowy Winnipeg. Welcome How you to doing, all. Chris? Thanks so much for having us here today. Yeah, it's nice to have you here. Okay, we've got to take care of this first. It's a great story. How did you come up with the name of the group Trio St. Laurent? Well, Jean-François and I were admiring the St. Laurent River at Domaine Forget. Right. And um, we had just played a concert there with Les Violons du Roi uh-huh. and had a great party. So <laughs> <laughs> uh, after the evening, we were just uh, watching actually the sunrise right. um, and promised ourselves that um, we really wanted to start a trio. And we brainstormed a few pianist names. And of course, uh, Phil was way at the top uh, of, our, of our wish list. Right. <laughs> Gladly he accepted. And actually, when we started playing together, we did not call ourselves Trio Saint Laurent just yet. Huh? We had a, a cute, funny star, startup name, was uh, Trio Cano. Huh. Because after our first concert, we went on a canoe uh, canoe ride. Trip together, yeah. yeah. Right. So we were named the Trio Cano for a few seasons, and when things started getting more serious, then we thought, oh, we should probably have a more proper name. Because I, I was thinking, I, I heard about the canoe story. I'm thinking, well, there's nothing more Canadian. All yeah. you need is some <laughs> toques and some hockey sticks, and you're, you're good to go. Exactly, but, uh, the St. Lawrence and a canoe. That's all you need. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a great story. Um, I want to talk about uh, the program for Saturday night. You're calling it Homage à Schumann. Why Schumann, and how did this central focus of Schumann come about? If I can start, you know, I I think when we were thinking about this program, well, we really want always to show, I think, the very best of the instruments that we bring. And so with Marina, such a fantastic violist, and Jean-Francois, our great clarinetist, um, it's instruments you don't always hear um, so prominently, right? And so when we think about the composer who really did such great justice um, to these instruments and to the colors that are so unique to them, Right. And the and the spirit that they bring, um, it was so obvious to us that that it would be Schumann that we would bring tribute to. Okay, so how did you come? Up, okay, so you've got Schumann. How did you come up with the pieces 
that sort of center around Schumann, you know, the, the yeah, Gada yeah. and the, yeah. Of course. Out. Well, I think Marino, we've, uh, you can talk about the Clara perhaps first, uh, based on your album with L's and everything. Aren't we playing the Mission Builder? Oh, we are yeah. on that. I keep thinking we're doing the Clara <laughs> yeah, Schumann. Yeah, yeah. Gosh, <laughs> it's so hard when we're playing concerts. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, it's all a big blur. But um, <laughs> the piece that we start the program with are the Mission Builder. Right, and the they're the, the pictures of fairy tales. And um, this is one of the first work written for viola and piano. It was written for Josef Joachim, who was a great friend of Brahms and Schumann. Right. And you can, uh, you can only imagine at that point, uh, viola is trying to play this work, you know, because the viola writing was only accompaniment right. at this stage because the size of the instrument was so large and so uncomfortable to play. So um, when you when you imagine violin is trying to play this work, it's it's. It's quite a funny picture, but I think um, it, the instrument evolved so well because of Schumann giving this, setting the tone for the for the next repertoire. So we st we are starting with these fairy tales, and Jean Francois Gade pieces are uncannily similar to what I'm playing, and it's so um, intimate and yeah. precious that I want to steal it and play it on viola. <laughs> and it's it's interesting. I know these Gade pieces. They were very much inspired by Schumann's fantasy Stück, and they're yeah, in fact. Like, it's very much like Schumann, except maybe a little colder, and kind of colder in the signs of cold weather. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because uh, I mean, he was coming from the north. It's with Denmark, but, yeah. But uh, I mean, it's lovely with the the, the center movement. With is a is a ballad with themes from the the. Uh, yeah, uh, I think it's a Norwegian uh, folk yeah, tune. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So. Uh, what else uh, about this piece? It's it just it's a su it's a surprising for us clarinetists to have this piece. It's very early because we had not much repertoire from from I mean except Mozart and Schumann. It's very it's, it's very limited. self limited what we have. And speaking of Mozart, this is one of the first trio that uh, was yes. written for a formation. So that's why it appears on our Schumann program, even though it's not necessarily uh, related program wise. But uh, Schumann was definitely inspired by. The Kegelstadt trio when he wrote his, and it's it's it seems so funny, it's so strange for me now because uh, clarinet and viola blend so well mm -hmm. together. They're both sort Perfect. of like the the darker, warmer instruments right. of their respective sections. It wor it works out so well. Kind of like cousins. Yes, mm -hmm. yeah, and Max Brook obviously, oh. you know, and, yeah. and felt felt that way as well. Oh, that's wonderful. And one of the other things I was noticing about the concert is it's very much. There's not only the Schumann fairy tales, but there's the fairy tale narrations with uh, clarinet, viola, and piano. So, and Philip, maybe you want to maybe talk about those? Uh, the trio pieces, you yeah, mean? The then the, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, which is really so phenomenal that Schumann, um, the fairy tale that he wrote for trio, which is basically the next piece written for clarinet, viola, and piano after the Mozart, right? So much later. So interesting that then he decides to combine these instruments together for one of the last, pretty much the last major piece that he wrote in his lifetime before... Um, he was committed and, and to the right. asylum. Right. I mean, and it's startling, um, if you know a little bit about the story, just how, um, how aware the music is. I mean, just how present he is in it, how sincere and how much, how much warmth is. It's just incredible storytelling, even in the midst of all that's happening in his life, you know? Mm. And, and, and there's such phenomenal pieces, just like the Merchant Builder that we start with, um, well, actually, unlike them, where we kind of have a, a small idea what the stories might be based on. Yeah, there, there is some like research done in, right. in um, tales attributed to each movement, but not, for not for the, the trio. trio. Yeah. This yeah. is, Which is completely really... different. Yeah, and I was reading that uh, for the trio, he wrote it extremely quickly, like in a matter of days. Right. And Clara, his wife, was said that she, there was no real... He didn't have a long process. Yeah, for yeah, that. yeah. It was just it just sort of happened. Well, and the thing with Schumann, right, as from, from what we know from other people's writings and whatnot, is that he waited. He was, you know, people when people think about Schumann's music, if they don't understand it right away, they like to say, "Oh, well, well, you know, he was going crazy, yeah. for lack of a better word." But the, the the thing about Schumann is that people don't always often realize is that he he was quite aware of what was happening, and he waited for moments of clarity and lucidity before daring right. to put pen to paper. You know, yeah. and so he was. Think, I think especially towards the end, he was probably thinking quite a lot and then when he had those moments of lucidity then he would 
Right. Sit down and write. I, I always think of Schubert or Sch- of Schumann, sorry, as sort of a master of the miniature. I'm thinking not only the, these pieces, yeah. but also the piano works as well, right? Yeah, the yeah, Carnival. Yeah, 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 all the, all all the character stuff. pieces. All those yeah. little, little tiny morsels that are just, it's so beautiful. And they really, they also combine into creating often very large narratives at the same time. You right. know, for, for being small character pieces, they they really feel like a complete book of fables each time, like a, right. like a real story. It's yeah. amazing. It's, it's all the facets it's of wonderful. storytelling. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so now we're going to talk about the Georg, Georgi Kurtag piece. <laughs> We've uh, been avoiding it, Chris? I, no, no, no. <laughs> I, I, listened, I listened to it this, this morning. It is, well, completely different. I mean, it's a great piece. There's so many great textures mm-hmm. uh, that uh, Kurtag uh, creates. Can you maybe talk about this piece? Well, f- for me, this this work is one of the richest that there is in our formation. Um, I heard it for the first time in Philadelphia when I studied there. Uh, Kim Kashkashian uh, is one of Kortag's ambassador. He wrote for her uh, a lot. And, and yes, it's very uh, folklore-oriented, but um, he's deeply inspired by Bartok and Ligeti, and so you can hear that in his music. It's a language that is very new, you know, he's still a living composer in, in his 90s, right. but it's very relatable and, and very dramatic, very uh, theater-like, you know, um, and there's, there's so much to, to take on as a new audience member. Right. Uh, it's kind of going to a contemporary museum and not necessarily understanding, but being very impressed by all the contrast and the dialogues. Yeah. So I think this this piece is always a crowd pleaser for us in a strange way. Yeah. That's the one piece that everybody comes after the show and just say like, wow, that core tag. So it's, we're, we're yeah, always secretly so happy about that. Because for the most part in the, in the program, it's like we have the Mozart, it's quite classical, and, and Schumann, the pieces that we chose are, are really, I don't want to say easy listening, as in they're simple, but they're really pleasant yeah. to listen to, and, and they fall in the ears really, really beautifully. And so the Kurtag, I think the audience is, we, we do speak to them, you know, mm-hmm. from, from the stage about it a little bit beforehand. And I, I think because they've, they've been enjoying themselves throughout, then when we say, listen, these first five movements, for example, they take about 30, 45 seconds each. So they're going to, if you blink, you're going to miss it. And so I think they're really primed then to really give all of their, right. their attention, you know, to, for what's going to come. Because it is dense in a very short Punch. I love. I love. He sometimes describes his music as fragments, and it's 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 a perfect description of this of this piece and great fragments. At the same, fragments with extreme expressivity yeah. in every uh, single micro particle of music. You know, right, right, like, right. like so I've I've never heard Jean Francois. I've never heard a clarinet play as softly mm-hmm. because Courtag demands it. He demands yeah. such adherence to very specific markings in his music right. for a real effect. Yeah. And I've never heard two people execute them so extremely well. I uh, mean, it's, it's, it's a pleasure to, to witness each time. I have to ask, uh, when I was listening to it this morning, is he using normal musical notation? No, right? There's got to yeah, be... Everything's normal. I would say... I, I think everything's normal. There's no like funny colors or bizarre signs or the most... Funny thing would be, it's not, it's been there for 50, maybe 80 years, the, the kind of the speeding up in a, in a, in a right. the beginning, mm-hmm. to yeah, something yeah. like that, but that's not new at all. Uh, for composers, notation is so limited to express what, what they mean and to have a longevity of those ideas. So if, if you think in Cortag's writing, um, it's not minimalist. Everything is written, and and I have heard only how he can be so demanding in coachings and on one note, spending like yeah. about three hours. You know, <laughs> he's very detailed oriented, and and his his notation is um, in such a way also, and also the, he writes a lot of text to explain right. uh, in in great depth. Uh. Actually, that's what I love with with him. It's just <laughs> feelings that uh, humans feelings like very very. Ex- uh, expressive and, and intense rage or happiness or and, and that's something I lack sometimes in new music. <laughs> <laughs> it's like real stuff. Nice, mm-hmm. nice. Same as Mozart did or Schumann did, but expressed in a different way, of mm-hmm. course, but very, very human. If I can say, I always love to, to, to relate music to food. It's like my thing. And so it's like, for me, it's a little bit molecular gastronomy. It's like, it's salmon. It's salmon as we know it as its foundation. Right. It's, it's, it's music, but it's salmon that you've then, you sort of cook down 
into its bare essences and then you've steamed it so now it's a gas and then you've, com- you've reconstituted it back <laughs> into a pill form and then you shatter that pill and you sprinkle it over something. Like it's really so, yeah. dense. so dense, yeah, yeah. but it's still the same thing at the, heart, at the heart of it, you know, the emotions he's expressing. Mm-hmm. I just want to quickly, uh, Philip, maybe you can talk about the John Burge piece that you're uh, going to be playing. Of course, thank you for that, that segue. So John Burge, who is a phenomenal composer uh, from Kingston, Ontario, based in Kingston, Ontario, Queen's University prof. Um, he's a great friend, a colleague of mine. Um, we were in the midst of recording an album of his 24 Preludes for Solo Piano. And I, we knew that I, we wanted very much to, to showcase a, a new Canadian work on this tour. We actually got that disc, disc in. I need to put it in the system. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Good, Chris. I'll wait for it. I'm going <laughs> to check with your listeners, see if you're playing it. Um, and so, uh, John, I, I sort of hesitantly asked him because I know the guy is so busy and writing quite a lot of fantastic music these days, and he readily accepted, which I was so grateful for. And so what he's done is he's taken one of Schumann's most famous songs, in fact, part of a wedding present um, that he gave to, to Clara, his wife, um, who was just such a huge inspiration to him. Vidmang um, is, is the name of the lead, the, uh, the art song. Right. And it means devotion and dedication. And so John sort of takes a, he, he plays with the rhythms and the, and, and the, the rhythmic energy of that song, rather than a melody, in fact, and has uh, created a whole new piece out of it. Uh, uh, and I'm, I, I, I love playing it each and every single time. That's great. Uh, I understand you have one more piece that, you, that you're going to play for us. Maybe just when you, somebody want to set it up, and tell us what you're going to play. We're going to play the first movement of the Schumann Fairy Tales for uh, our trio formation. Beautiful. And uh, we're so looking forward to meeting you on Saturday. Mm-hmm. Thank you so much for giving thanks, us this space. <laughs> thanks, for, thanks for stopping by. Yeah, I'll, I'll let you to have yet. I'll let you to it.
Absolutely lovely. Philip, Marina, and Jean Francois, I want to thank you so much for stopping by our Classic 107 studios and talking to us. It's just been a real treat. Thanks a lot for having us, Chris. It's been really great. Join Trio St. Laurent this Saturday night at 7.30 at the University of Winnipeg's Eckhart Gramate Hall for a very diverse and entertaining program centered around Robert Schumann. This is going to be a fantastic concert and a great way to start the Virtuosi 2020 year. From our studios in downtown Winnipeg, you've been listening to 107 Live, Classic 107's Intimate Concert Series, the soundtrack for your life.